Good morning. The lesson from the Old Testament for this morning is found in Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16, found on page 572 of the Old Testament in your pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will, be, will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The lesson from the New Testament for this morning is found in Revelation 21, 1 through 5, found on page 204 of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. The word of God for the people of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, these words of yours are so full of hope and so full of promise. Help us not to gloss over them. Help us not to take them too lightly. Help us to, to know your hope and your promise deep within our souls. And during this time, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I, I hope it was a time full of too much food, too much football. I know that uh, for a couple of the teams, it was a little too much football for them. Um, uh, for Bears fans, wow. Um, <laughs> But I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. One of the things that I love about Thanksgiving, one of the things that is just one of those pristine moments, is looking out after all the work has been done and realizing the house is clean. Just looking for a moment and being able to see across the floor to know that there are no Legos between point A and point B waiting to stick into my foot. That, that, that wonderful moment of a clean house. But back in my mind, I know that it's just a momentary fleeting thing. Because with a five-year-old and a two-year-old, it just won't stay that way. For a brief moment, I get to see hope. I get to see the, the idea of a clean house, a, you know, a, a clean floor, the way that we've always wanted it. But eventually, I know that that dish is going to appear on the counter, and it's going to find other dishes to go with it, and they're going to sit there for days and absolutely refuse to go into the dishwasher. And at that point, I know it's all over. At that point, I know that disaster is going to strike. I know that my hope of a clean house ends with that dish. It's interesting because in some ways the, the people of Judah around the time of Jeremiah kind of had that same experience, that clean house experience. 
that's also very, very unsettled. The people during Jeremiah's time, uh, Judah during Jeremiah's time was in kind of a precarious situation. Technically, they still ruled themselves, but they had, a, they had large empires around them that were ready to strike. They had some religious problems that were occurring. And I'll start with, with this religious aspect of the times of Jeremiah. Uh, Judah, at that point, had turned away from the law of Moses. That covenant law that, that, that God had given to Moses at Sinai, and in which he had promised these blessings, if you just hold to my law. And curses, if you don't hold to the law. And the people had rebelled, not rebelled, but so much as taking other religions in and saying, well, I mean, it can't hurt if, you know, just to be on the safe side, if we take in this religion and that, offer sacrifices to some other gods. Josiah, who had ruled immediately before Jeremiah's time, though had been an upright ruler, he had been a righteous ruler, and returned the people to the law of Moses. He did right what was he did right in the eyes of God, in the eyes of Yahweh, as it puts it. However, he would be the last king of Judah to do so. Like I said, the law promised blessings for the people if they followed it, and it promised curses for not following it. And so when we approach the text for today, we have the weight of all of these promises behind it, and not just the Mosaic Covenant, not just the, the promises of blessing in, in the law of Moses, but if you, if, for those of you who are here, we went through Genesis this summer, and part of what God does for Abraham is a, God gives Abraham promises of a future. God gives Abraham promises of descendants, of land, the promise that he would be the father of many nations, that rulers would come from him. He also promised that he would have a relationship with God. And because of the blessings and curses in the law, Judas, Judah's religious problems, their turning from the law of Moses, their worshiping of foreign gods and foreign idols, we're starting to have problems on it politically. As I mentioned, there were a couple of empires uh, that really liked the, the, uh, the land that Judah was on. Judah is kind of at the bottom of that red area near the Dead Sea. And two, the two empires of the day were Egypt in Babylon, and Babylon was once again rising to power. Egypt controlled Judah for about five years before, uh, in, uh, in year 605, Nebuchadnezzar, that great king of Babylon, who most of us know for the, great, the, the hanging gardens of Babylon, came in and took over Judah. Now, Nebuchadnezzar left the, the rulers of Judah there. He left the kings. But despite the kings and the people and the leadership still being there, they desired to not be any, under any foreign power. They desired to rule themselves. They wanted freedom. And that's the background of where we pick up today's text. Religious decline and political uncertainty, an empire that exists, or a, a kingdom that exists only at the mercy of someone else. And we come into today's text, and while we might expect there to be judgment and the promise of the covenant blessings for turning away from God, we find something else. We find that, uh, like the phrase, only Nixon could go to China, only God could offer hope in the midst of disobedience. 
Because here in the midst of Judah's disobedience, despite being called by prophets for years upon years upon years, despite the coming judgment, despite the foreign powers, despite their unfaithfulness time and time and time again, God comes in with words of hope. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will carry out the good word which I spoke to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. Interesting that God mentions both the house of Israel and the house of Judah here. The, the kingdom of Israel had been gone for about 120 years. And yet here is God offering hope for them as well. God's promises that He will make His covenant blessings come to pass aren't based on Israel's or Judah's faithfulness because at this point it's pretty evident that they don't have the faithfulness that the law calls for. But because of God's own faithfulness and God's own word, they're grounded in God Himself. God's promise is that He will cause a righteous shoot to come for David's line. That once again a Davidic king will come and will sit on the throne. And again, this isn't anything that Israel and Judah have to do themselves. No, this is God coming and saying, Behold, I will make this come to pass. I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And it's not, we find, that until this righteous branch, this righteous shoot that comes for David's line, comes, that justice and righteousness will happen. It's funny, we like to think of ourselves as being capable of justice and righteousness. And in fact, we do have a measure of justice and righteousness that happens every day. There are people who are correctly convicted for crimes, sentences that are justly meted out. We fix some wrongs in the world, and we, we do some things that are good, but it's never quite good enough, is it? It never quite gets to that point where we think, ah, finally, justice and righteousness is being done all over the world. In some ways, this is kind of like a child trying to make a recipe. You know, Ian is, is five, and he is fully capable of doing some of the things in a recipe. He loves to mix the spices together for, for pumpkin pie. The trick is keeping it in the bowl, of course. <laughs> He's able to do some of the parts, but let me tell you, if you gave him the recipe and let him go, ooh, I wouldn't be wanting to, to eat those to eat that. Individual parts may get done correctly if a child is given a recipe, but on the whole, I'm willing to bet that the recipe will get botched. While we may do justice in some small ways, it's temporary, and it's easily broken. It's not until the righteous shoot comes that a true and lasting peace Shalom comes and will occur. And that problem is, and the problem is that we like to look for hope in our own efforts in our, and in our own institutions, don't we? When we think of hope, we, we like to think of what we can do. And many of the places that we look for hope are good and noble places. Education, for example, which Kristen mentioned this morning, that's a, a very, very Presbyterian 
value, a very Presbyterian place to look for hope. Our own vision statement includes hope in education. We look for education to help with issues of poverty, to help with so many issues, but it's still not an ultimate solution. We can look to government and we can look to political movements. If we just elect this person, if we just pass this law, if we just do this, if we just get the right people on the bench, if we get the right people off the bench, <laughs> if we just back the right pack, super pack, whatever, maybe we'll get what we're looking for. We can look to social justice movements. We become active in our communities, wanting to bring reconciliation and, pro and prosperity. But it never seems to quite get there. And justice can become an end in of itself with no basis in anything else. And then when it falls apart, we wonder why. We appeal to people's inner goodness and to inner, people's inner justice and people's inner sense of fairness, forgetting just how broken we are. And how sinful we can be. We look to medicine to, to cure our ills, to give us hope. We look to things even such as how many of us have organic food somewhere in our fridge, hoping that we'll lose that, those 20 pounds. We look to our churches. We look to our churches wanting them to have good, upright people in them, and our heart even more deeply when we find out that they're just full of sinful, broken people like ourselves. How many of us have been hurt because we found that in a church? The reality is the church in and of itself doesn't have the hope. The church points to the one true hope. And I don't want to say that none of these places do any, or institutions or movements do any good. Of course they do good, but they don't offer real, lasting hope. And so our hope in Advent is not that our hope is in our hands. Our hope in Advent is that our hope is out of our hands. We see how much we fail at bringing peace into our world. We see how much hope shatters on our hand like fragile, fragile glass. And we realize we need someone to execute justice and righteousness for us because, boy, we do a good job of the opposite. So we eagerly await a Savior. We await someone who is outside of ourselves. We await the message of peace on earth from heaven's all-gracious King. We await a Savior for, that's outside of us, a Savior that can save us from our own problems, the things that we can't escape. We await a Savior that, that can do things that education and, and government and, and the church never could do and never will do. We await a hope that is greater than the events in our history. And we wait in hope that when we proclaim the birth of Christ, we proclaim a hope that comes from outside of us, even though Christ becomes one of us. While the future may have looked bleak for Israel in Jeremiah's time, God's faithfulness to his promises and to his word and to his justice couldn't be thwarted by the human events and the human failures and the human foibles of Jeremiah's time. That's the faithfulness and promise that we look to this Advent season. That's why we light the first candle in expectant hope. 
And that's why we begin our Advent in hope. Because God with us will come to us to rescue ourselves from us. It's a hope that's worth believing in, a hope that is enduring and lasting, and a hope that is grounded in the sure faithfulness of God. May we look to that hope this Christmas season. Pray with me. Faithful God, remind us time and time again of your hope during this season. Remind us that if hope were left in our hands, it would shatter. But hope left to you is hope worth believing in. That you can bring real and lasting peace and wholeness to our lives. As we wait, Lord Jesus, Remind us of your goodness and your mercy. We ask all this in your name. Amen. As a response, let's sing and, uh, stand and sing hymn 48. Lo, how a rose air blooming. Please be seated. Our tradition here is to give the names of those that we want to pray for, and I usually come around and ask, and I will do that again. I'll start here. Jack. Fantastic. Good. Barb Walton is home. Sharon? All right. <laughs> Sarah? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Jennifer? <laughs> My goodness. Karen? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Amy? My sister Judy had knee surgery, and my gene started also for the blood cancer. Yes, 
Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. All right, come around here. Mary. For all who are going to take a card from the angel tree. Okay. Yes. Yes. And for the uh, students driving back to college. Mm hmm. Absolutely. George. Excellent. Bob. Absolutely. Mary Alice? Sam and John. Yes. Mary? Mary. Yep. Stu? For a friend of Tom who lost his father this week. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Balcony? Edie? Yes. Yes. Vicky? Absolutely. All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Faithful and loving God, in the shadow of thanksgiving, we recognize that we have so much to give you thanks for. We give you thanks first and foremost for the season of Advent, for the expectant hope of your Son. We thank you that you didn't leave us to find hope for ourselves. You brought hope. And that what we couldn't do for ourselves, you took it upon yourself to do for us. We thank you for this hope that we find in Christ, knowing that it's an enduring hope. It's a hope that will go from generation to generation. We thank you for our families and friends. We thank you for all the conversations and for all the, the food that was shared, for all the fellowship. We pray that if there are any rifts in families, any things that need to be ironed out, that you would do that, Lord. We thank you for our church families. Thank you for the ministries of both Broadway and Good Shepherd. And pray that through us that you would further advance your good news, your gospel. Pray, Lord, this week for the work of our worship team, for the work of our Christian education team, and for the work of congregational growth and care. Lord, as they set the, the work of those respective areas of the church, we ask that your Spirit would be upon them. We ask that you would give us a vision for your gospel. That you would help us in the work of worship. That you would help us in training people up in the ways of discipleship and reaching others. Lord, we pray for our youth group. Thank you that you have brought young people to us and, and that we would take that responsibility seriously and joyfully, recognizing the good work that you do in their lives and through them, remembering that we are all your children, that your call falls on us equally. Lord, we recognize that there are those in our church family that are hurting and are need 
in need of your healing grace. Lord, we think particularly of the Love family, and we pray for Brandy that she would be touched by your Spirit. Lord, we pray for Virginia, and we pray for Holly. Ask that your continuing healing would be with them. Lord, we pray for for Sue and for Paula and for Tom and ask that your grace would be all-sufficient. Lord, we could go on praying for others. And there are so many needs amongst our congregations that we ask that you would hear us now as we pray for those needs in our hearts. Lord, we also remember those that we would love to see come into a relationship with you, and we lift their names to you now. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thankful you for who you are, Lord Jesus, for what you did for us on the cross. For you, Holy Spirit, as you continue to work in and through us, despite our many, many failures. Pray that when we minister and as we worship together, that it would may truly be said that they love you, Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hear us now as we pray the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.